From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos is hoping to stretch an abbreviated term into at least four more years. One day I will be the first black female elected statewide in the state of Rhode Island. Never. Matos this week officially kicked off her campaign asking voters to elect her to the office Governor Dan McKee handpicked her for. But it's a crowded field. Matos joins Republican John Lugo, Democrat Cynthia Mendez, Republican Paul Pence, and Democrat Deborah Giro. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with you once again. Congratulations on your kickoff. Thank you. Um, you've been in office for one year this month. Yes. You're seeking a full term. You already have the job, but voters haven't given it to you yet. Mm -hmm. Why should they? Because I think in this last year, I had proven themself, uh, to the voters that I'm serious about the work. I had been working really hard alongside Governor McKee to make sure that uh, we are, have a presence on the 39 cities and towns, and that we are making sure that we bring the resources that those um, voters need in, in every community, especially making sure that we had vaccination clinics in the different um, municipalities in making sure that the vaccine was available to everyone who wanted it because that's making a big difference right now and why our, our economy is stronger and is, is one of the stronger economies for reopening because of the work that was done in this past two years. And I think if I can go back and just paint the picture for um, the um, voters out there, when I was appointed lieutenant governor, I come in into an office that is no staff, have to be, the office has to be put together, uh, rebuilt. The staff that was there, most of them transitioned with the governor to the office of the governor. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, it was just me and my chief of staff, Ernie Almonte, who I'm so grateful that he decided to come in that journey with me when I asked him, because it was building the office from the beginning while doing the work, because we didn't stop. You could see that my office, I was everywhere, I had a presence everywhere, but in the meantime, we're building the team and building the office. Learning on the job. Learning on the job, and I'm not stopping. So we had on last week Deborah Giro, who's yes. uh, also entered the primary for lieutenant governor, and she um, was emphasizing she would be independent of the governor's office if she were lieutenant governor. And obviously you're in a somewhat unusual position because the governor picked you because yes. of the transition, whereas usually these offices are elected independently. However, you said in your speech yesterday, I was mm -hmm. there at your kickoff, you said Governor McKee has let you serve, quote, independently. What would you point to as an example of you being independent of the governor who picked you in the job so far? I have to say that having the opportunity to bring my voice and my life experience when conversations that we have, when I, I, we have regular one-on-one -on -one in which we sit down and talk, I give him my perspective. I remember I can tell you about things just bringing to his attention um, some feedback that I was getting from people in the community, from some groups in the community that felt that uh, their voice was not being part of the process. And I'm able to have that type of conversation, direct conversations with the, with the governor and give the, let him know what I'm, what I'm hearing out there and what is the perspective that maybe he's not, he's not getting to him. And that has value. And we have been always saying that the state of Rhode Island, the governor and the lieutenant governor don't get along. So now when we are getting along, people says, oh, well, that's not good. No, I think it's good that we're able to have conversation, honest conversations, give feedback to one another and work in collaboration. What would you say, if you look at your first year, is your biggest accomplishment as lieutenant governor? What's something you could point to that happened that maybe you think wouldn't have happened if you weren't in the room or part of the conversation? I think that my uh, appointment has influenced a lot the housing uh, conversation uh, within the uh, governor's uh, McKee um, um, leadership. I, from the get-go, when all of you interview me, if you get uh, chosen what's gonna be the issue that you're gonna be working on, I have said housing. And I, I, the governor has embraced the, the housing agenda, has allocated a historic quarter of a billion dollar for housing that never we never saw that before 
uh, and, here and in the state of Rhode Island. And what's your role in that? You're talking about his allocation, all of that. But to Ted's question, what, what has been your role in the um, area of housing since you did identify mm -hmm. that as your top issue? Oh, influencing the conversation and showing how it can be done and, and showing that housing is the only solution to the problem of homelessness that we have right now in the state and housing is we need to make sure there is affordable housing available because when we are trying to talk about education health especially coming out of the pandemic the number one thing that people needed in order to be safe is to have a place to call home where they can go to. All right, so this sort of dovetails into housing, and I, I want to ask you about a major headline uh, from this week, and to remind our viewers, uh, you are city council president mm -hmm. in Providence. You are a resident of Providence, and yes. this week a deal was announced to breathe life into the Superman building. Now, the city council appears to have pretty significant leverage over this deal, putting your old hat on. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the city council should be looking for in exchange for granting the tax stabilization agreement or the, or the TSA? So the TSA has been going through a lot of process of improvement since I got elected to the city council as one, was one of the, my number one priorities actually. If you go back to the records you will see how I was always very vocal about improving the TSA process. One of the things that we did while I was president of city council is to make sure that we are allocating 10 percent of the um, of the income, the resources from the TSA is allocated for the housing trust fund. We have to do, uh, we have been doing a lot to improve the process. I think every council member that is there right now, that is their mission. How can they make the process better? How can they improve the TSA process and any other uh, tax stabilization that or uh, tax agreement that the city decides to go into? Uh, that's an ongoing process. There's always opportunity for improvement, and I believe that the council members uh, that are there should be looking at that. And, and I, I want to go back a little bit and tell you there have been several conversations that I have been part of in the past trying to save the building, the Superman building. And there have been different proposals that came. Some of them, um, I'm not at liberty to share the details because it didn't come to that point. But there were several initiatives that wanted to bring the building back. I have to say this plan is really good. I'm not saying it's perfect. And we're not, my experience in government gonna tell you, you're not gonna find the perfect, perfect deal. But this deal is really good because it has a housing component. It's gonna allow to bring more residents to the downtown and, and to the downtown neighborhood. Downtown right now is a neighborhood, and that's going to help the small businesses in downtown that has been suffering, especially now that because of the pandemic, a lot of people have been working remotely. Uh, 20, Twenty percent of the units uh, going in there are going to be deemed affordable if this deal goes through. But look, the definition of affordability mm -hmm. uh, really varies greatly. How confident are you? that these units will truly be affordable to the people that need them. Okay, so there are different levels of affordability. And I have a track record working in Oneville with Oneville Housing, now one neighborhood builder, building affordable housing uh, at, for over a very low income level. I believe that this deal is um, for the Superman building is allowing to have about 20% of the units to be affordable. And what would rent look like then? to you. I don't have the final numbers. I haven't seen the final numbers, but I can tell you that we want uh, teachers to live in the city. We want uh, police officers to live in the city. We want the firefighters to live in the city. And most of them cannot afford to buy or to, or to rent in the city of Providence right now. And this, this, the same thing that happened in the city of Providence, when I go throughout the state of Rhode Island to speaking to other communities, they're facing the same challenges. They would like to have those young professionals live in their community, but those young professionals cannot afford to live there. Your former colleagues in Providence are now pushing the assembly to okay, uh, letting them borrow about half a billion dollars um, to put into the pension fund. You dealt with that issue. Every yeah. Providence leader has over the years. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you support that initiative? I support this. Uh, this deal is a lot better than the one before. I, I like the process that is being taking place. Um, the uh, mayor and his team has made, have been making the dual dil diligence of reaching out to the different stakeholders. Uh, making sure that everybody's informed. 
I like the way how this process is going. I'm looking forward to see what is the decision that the General Assembly is going to be making, if they're going to approve it. But most important, I think, given the opportunity to the voters of the city of Providence to decide, they're going to have the last word. Republicans, to Tim's point about yeah. the Superman building, the Republicans put out a statement this week saying, on the one hand, you have the city saying we're going to give a $5 million check to the Superman building developer, give them a really low $10 million loan, give them a big TSA for all these years. And at the same time, the city's saying we're in such tough financial shape, we need to borrow half a billion dollars. And, you know, they're saying you, you, the city shouldn't be spending that mm -hmm. money on the Superman building if it's in such peril on the pension side. How do you square those two things to voters who might say, yeah, how does Providence have the money for the Superman project when it's in such trouble in the pension fund? Well, what I can say is it's always easy to say no. I just want, I would ask what are the alternative, what ideas they have. How are we going to solve the problem of having this building in the middle of Providence? That's so, such a part of the, uh, of the landscape of Providence of Rhode Island. Uh, close, dark, and bringing all this negative um, energy to the center of, of the city, to the downtown. So to those that think that this deal is not good, I want to hear what proposals they have. What are the alternatives that they have? You have been asked multiple times about the FBI investigation into the contract that was awarded in to education consulting firm Isla Group, and you have said you're going to reserve comment about that until the investigation concludes, so I will not waste your time nor mine Thank by you. asking that question again. But I do want to hear from you if you are satisfied with the work Ilo Group did for nearly $2 million. I have not gone into details of what the work has been done. I trust that the governor's team um, in, and the professionals that we have in the state of Rhode Island that are looking at the, uh, the performance, if they, they are satisfied with the work that they have done. Have you heard from education leaders about this and asking questions about um, the contract? I have not heard from any education leaders about this. Okay. No one has come to me bringing it as, as an issue saying that they are not satisfied with the work. I've said right now, I have not heard directly from anyone. You're one of the most visible Latino, Latina leaders, obviously, in Rhode Island. And I, I was struck as I was at your uh, kickoff yesterday thinking there is a Latina candidate for governor this year, a Latina incumbent mm -hmm. for lieutenant governor, and a Latino candidate for yeah. general treasurer, three of the statewide offices. You've been in politics uh, since you first ran in 2006. I guess, how do you think about that um, from your perspective? As you said, someone who came here mm -hmm. not speaking much, if any, English yeah. um, when you were 20 and now being part of a group of Latino candidates seeking the highest offices in the state. This is a good moment, just not only for Latino candidates, for minority candidates in general, but this is good for the state of Rhode Island. The Latino candidates, are, we're not the, much different than the uh, candidates that came before, the Irish, the Italian. Um, the state of Rhode Island has been a place that has been welcoming to new generations, so it just happened that now it's Latino, but I don't think it's any different than, than other groups before. I think it's a good moment that we have so much diversity within the um, elected officials in the state of Rhode Island, for the people that are seeking office. In, in it's good because, honestly, I was so uh, grateful that, um, that young girl, Christina, uh, wanted, and she was, when I asked her, she was very enthusiastic about um, opening and introducing me. It's the student government president at Classical High at, who introduced you yesterday. At, at, at Central. At, at Central, Central, excuse yeah. me. Yep. At, Central. at Central. Yes, in, 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 honestly, this is what it's about, is to show, showing her that she can do it also. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to solve all the problems for, uh, for the um, minority students, for, for the young uh, people of the state of Rhode Island, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm a, an example to them that it can be done and that they can do it themselves and that the sky is the limit. They can go even beyond. It, I get things, I, I wish people can understand the importance of showing our young kids that they, there, is a, there, is a, there is a space for them in, in the decision making table. Of, of the state of Rhode Island, of this nation. And I, I feel very um, satisfied to get messages from young people that reach out to me. And every time I, I tr try to take the time, make the time to meet with them, I get um, requests from people that heard about me and they want to meet me. 
Um, I'm so impressed with the, the future of the, the young people that are right now in high school and that are getting ready to go into college. They reach out to me and, and ask me about how I got here. They're curious. So I think that we shouldn't un underestimate that. When I, like a couple, a uh, few weeks ago, I got a text from my daughter saying, uh, when are we going to uh, Washington the next time? Because I want to go and see my future house, the White House. Like, <laughs> this is just, it's, this is about that. This is about representation. Representation matters. And I'm fortunate and I'm grateful that I'm able to play this role um, on the life of the young people of Rhode Island. Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you so much. That went fast. It did go <laughs> fast. It was by. Which is a good sign. <laughs> when we come back, Target 12 investigator Eli Sherman will join Ted and I for a reporter's roundtable. We'll go in depth on the Superman building deal. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White, alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, and we're joined by Target 12 Investigator Eli Sherman. Eli, good to have you back. Um, Ted, we're gonna dive into the Superman building deal that we touched on quite a bit with uh, Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos on the first half, but just to, if you could break down the $220 million proposal to breathe new life into that vacant building. Yeah, so to the number, it's 223. Uh, this graphic oh. we're bringing up is not the graphic that we need for uh, here right now, <laughs> but that's okay. We'll talk about this in a minute. Yeah, so uh, you're but, getting a preview, folks, of uh, how much you'll have to pay. We'll, we'll look yeah. at that in a second. But first, let's talk about the overall financing of the deal. It's $223 million overall, they think, to the number to, to do this. That's the estimate anyway. The state's kicking in 20 six million dollars of that in subsidies between Rhode Island Housing and the Commerce Department. The feds have 24 million dollars in tax credits they mm -hmm. think they can get. The city, as you were talking about in the first half, Tim, is going to give a $10 million, 1% interest, 40-year loan to the developer, and as well as $5 million maybe just as a check, and then uh, also a tax agreement. And then the owner is putting in $42 million, uh, $10 million of that is the land and the building. Right. Um, so, you know, we have it all online if people want to really see that closely, but the other half of it, basically, is just going to be borrowed, construction debt. So you have a lot of public money going into this project. So uh, in that grand total of more than $220 million, roughly $15 million at stake for the city of Providence, and, and you heard me ask uh, the lieutenant governor, who was previously city council president, uh, about that. And it does appear, Eli, that the city council has some significant leverage in this deal. Yeah, so in addition to the $15 million, as, um, as Ted laid out there, this tax stabilization agreement that they have to approve for the deal, and it's looking like it's going to be a, about 30 years long, could be one of the most significant um, public investments that goes into the building. And right now, that has to pass the city council. So at this point, they really do have an opportunity to say, hey, what exactly do we want from this developer, uh, David Sweetster, who left this building at the heart of our city empty for the last nine years, and, and come up with some ideas. I think uh, Dan McGowan of the Boston Globe called the city council a uh, cheap date in a column this week, <laughs> saying that they usually just will give them, but this could be an opportunity for them to say, hey, if you really wanna make this deal work, state, developer, we'd like to see you XYZ. In XYZ invest yeah. in the pension fund. Uh, there's any number of things that the city could use. Of course, the flip side of that, and as Lieutenant Governor Matos was saying, is the city has a big problem from the Superman building. Huge and empty building. Their counter argument <laughs> might be, well, city council, you can see from Kennedy Plaza that empty building. You know, if we wa if this deal falls apart, you have a big problem as well. So I think. I I myself am a little torn about you know the city council's leverage because you have this white elephant sitting there, which is part of the problem. So there, I'd assume they have to be kind of careful not to blow something up, and then the state leaders might say, "Well, then, fine, okay, then you guys figure it out." Well, let's talk about uh, it, as it popped up a little bit early there. I do want to talk about this affordable housing uh, question. As I said in the first half, 20% of the units are earmarked for affordable housing. You and Steph Machado did a, a breakdown and what affordable housing could be defined as it and that story got a lot of attention and, and the numbers are popping up on the screen here. Yeah, walk, so, walk us um, through. so they set it into three tiers which are popping up here. Uh, it's based on the area median income but we just went with the actual amount. So if you're making $48,450 a year, um, we estimate, because they won't give us actual rental numbers, they're looking at about twelve, eleven a month for rent uh, for the Superman building is what you'd be paying. If you make 60000 or so, you'd be paying about $1,500 a month in rent. If you're making $72,000, you would be paying $1,800 a month for rent. Now, these are just for the 
57 apartments out of the 285 they're going to build that have been designated as affordable. But certainly, Steph and I heard from a lot of people who did question whether that's really affordable. Can someone on right. $48,000 a year really afford twelve eleven dollars a month? Particularly, as we don't know, does that include utilities? Will there be amenities fees as we see at some of the other big buildings downtown, et cetera? So, um, you know, but, but calling it affordable, I think, is both a... a you know, it's part of the, I'll say, spin of officials to get people happy about this or the branding of it. And also some of this funding is for affordable housing. So they have to call it, they have to have these affordable units to access some of this money. And I wonder what an affordable housing unit will look like. I, I Good point. imagine it'll look different than the market price unit. Yeah, is it, a, is it an efficiency? Is it a studio? Is it right. a one bedroom? What yeah. are the prices there? You actually, you were in the building not too long ago, right? Yeah, I went up actually a couple of years ago down into the basement where they have a lot of the, the, the vaults old and... vaults where the banking uh, banking material used to be, and then also near to the top. We couldn't go all the way to the top, I think, because there were some concerns about the integrity of the structure. But <laughs> uh, really, a magnificent building. And when you go up to the top, you know you have this great, amazing look over uh, most of the city. And you know the developers have put out a deadline, I think, or a rough estimate as to when they want to start demolition in there of five to six months, which seems very aggressive, yeah. uh, considering. You when know, do they all say the people would might move in? Three, about three years from now, 2025, That's if fast. everything. I mean, I'm not a developer. Yeah, but. I mean, you know, and I've seen these timelines slip. So, yeah. uh, you know, we'll see what happens to that. I think, too, you know, and again, the Lieutenant Governor alluded to this. It's just, I've been thinking about it all week. I was talking to Matt Allen on WPRO about it. It's just a thorny problem. The tallest building in Rhode Island um, is in the middle of downtown, is empty and decaying. It's old use. There just isn't demand necessarily for that many offices especially with them not unless they're highly renovated because you know the Ramundo administration was very focused on bringing jobs in there they tried with PayPal right. they tried with Citizens Bank and they just couldn't close the deal and it would have been very expensive uh, anyway and, and we were on this we've asked people on the show guests on the show should it be torn down mm -hmm. that's the, the point at which we were there I want to I want to pivot to the soccer stadium in a second um, before I do real quick Ted it's been vacant for 10 years mm -hmm. almost I should say almost 10 years why now? What, what do you think spurred this decision? Well, I think of it some of what we were just talking about. I mean, every year that goes by and something doesn't happen, I think, adds to the pressure. I mean, anyone who's walked by there at Kenny Plaza, it, it doesn't look good. Um, you know, there's, there's structural questions um, without investment in there. And, you know, Joe Palino argues it is depressing property values. I think also, you know, it's an election year. I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a feeling among state officials that people want to see momentum and that putting this together, you know, and, and having a groundbreaking could be popular with folks. I think all of that is part of it. I think also, too, just one thing you can't discount is that for a long time, the developer argued that he couldn't make the money work on rents. And with inflation, we're seeing rent really tick up fast in Providence and the surrounding area. He may be looking at it now and thinking, you know what, those prices are getting to the point where I can actually start seeing my return on investment by doing something with that building. Yeah, it's, I mean, the vacancy rates in Providence, especially in the newer buildings, are just ridiculously low. You're, you're hearing about rent increases this year of 20% right. for people uh, in their apartments, which again is a hardship for individuals. But if you're a developer looking to make the math work, it actually can help. Well, and there could be another tower uh, coming online around the same time mm. with even more units, but that's, that's another conversation. Sort of folds into this, Eli, uh, this $220 million building deal comes at the same time as the news you broke about the most recent public-private partnership project in Pawtucket, a lot of alliteration <laughs> in that one, which you learned is facing headwinds. And this is, this is the proposed soccer stadium in Pawtucket. Yeah, this project started, uh, I believe, back in 2019 um, as a $400 million deal, and it came with a lot of bells and whistles, you know, the same sort of big uh, news conference that we saw here with the Superman building was happened with the soccer stadium. Now, since that deal was first introduced, it has gotten smaller and smaller over time. Initially, it included the apex land. Right. Um, that was taken off the table. So then it got slimmed down to about $300 million. And then just this past week, we're learning that because of inflation and because the soaring cost of building materials is hitting everybody, they're now reconsidering, okay, well, what is it really going to cost us to do this plan? And when you hit that kind of wall, you got to think, okay, I need some sort of injection of cash to 
pay more for the materials or I need to reduce right. the size of Two my options. project. Yeah. And right now we do not have a good idea as to exactly which way they're leaning, but we're expecting some of those answers to come out in the next couple of weeks. And I do think, Tim, that is goes when you go back to the Superman building, you have to see the Pawtucket one is raising questions that they'll face as well. What What is the outlook going to be for supplies and materials in the next 6, 12, 18 months? What's the economy look like with, with the, the inflation problems we have, the Fed raising rates, et cetera? Um, again, not to say at all this won't work, but um, certainly there's a, there's a lot of questions about the broader economic environment and any big project can be affected by those. And it would, 30 seconds left here, Ted, and what about, you know, we, pointed out it's an election year how concerned do you think people are uh, about the what are you hearing about concerns uh, yeah, about the uh, soccer, stadium, soccer stadium I think there's a feeling that you know decisions need to be made soon and I think frankly I think a lot of folks maybe haven't woken up yet to the fact that there might have to be a shift in the scale of that project to make the numbers work and I think you'll probably see more public conversation about that coming up but Mayor Grebian made clear to Eli this needs to happen for Pawtucket all right Ted Nisi Eli Sherman thank you very much everyone at home you're probably watching this on a Sunday. So happy Easter. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.